consistent self-improvement everybody you are now listening to american gypsy podcast i am your host classic and i'm here with my co-host gypsy and today we have xiao chen zhu and he is a business risk consultant as well as the founder and managing director of the study abroad research institute welcome to the show welcome thank you very much thank you very much to get started, um, for our listeners and also for myself, tell us a little bit about um, where you are. We're in Los Angeles right now. Yeah. Um, where are you at the moment? Uh, right now, I'm in Tokyo, uh, working from home. But uh, uh, as, as you guys mentioned, I'm a business risk consultant based in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and uh, mostly what I do is I help foreign investors who are looking to invest in Japanese companies uh, to figure out what the companies are, You know, what kind of risks there are you know, in doing business with these Japanese companies and you know, provide information in English or other languages that our clients know. Okay, so what, what got you started into this? What is it like as far as is this something that's coming, a career that's coming in you know, Tokyo or is it something that you just um, kind of ventured into on your own? Well, yeah, so, so I mean, there's a long history of me being in Japan. Uh, as you can tell by my name, I'm, I'm not Japanese at all. Uh, but uh, I actually grew up in Japan as a child. Uh, my parents used to live here when I was uh, in elementary school. So I spent about six years, six, seven years of my childhood in Japan, which is why I speak Japanese. But um, I came back to Japan in 2017 where I was doing a PhD program in sociology. Uh, studying, you know, immigrants and just uh, really international relations, you know, uh, foreign people coming to Japan, Japanese people going abroad. So, you know, I have a lot of personal interest in terms of, you know, relationship between people uh, from other countries and Japan. So that's sort of like a natural segue into my current line of work. Um, it's not a very common line of work. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of companies that do this. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't say it requires any sort of specialized skills, but it does take the language skills, you know, collecting information in Japanese and being able to communicate that to an audience that basically has very little understanding of Japan, right? So, you know, yeah. So there's a lot of both language and cultural interpretation going on, yeah. Okay. yeah. You said you grew up in China, though? No. You said you're not... He's um, not Japanese, but he right. grew up in Japan. Right. Yes. Where are you yes. from then? No. Yeah, so, so a bit complicated. Uh, I, I was born You said you were born in... Oh, you were born in China? Yes, that's okay. correct. I was born in China and left uh, when I was five years old. Okay. Uh, a family moved to Japan at that point in time. So I spent age five until age 12 in Japan. Yeah. Uh, so that was basically all of my elementary school plus kindergarten. Right. Uh, after that, uh, family moved to the U.S. And uh, currently my parents uh, live in California, in San Diego. So not too far from you guys. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm now with my family, um, living here alone, working here alone in Japan. Okay. Yeah. What, was, what was your experience like growing up in Japan? What is, you know, a little bit, because yeah. of course we're in America and even for our listeners, if they're international as well, but just to yeah. give us a little feel on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I was first in Japan, it was uh, the 1990s, right? The 90s, right? So um, Japan gets a lot of foreign visitors well, before COVID, got a lot of foreign visitors and there is a pretty big expat community in Japan these days. But back in the 90s, that wasn't the case. And uh, I didn't grow up being a big city in Japan. Uh, my parents uh, went to a university, but the university was a rather rural area, right? So we lived in a relatively small town in Japan. And basically uh, for that small town, aside from people connected to the university, it was very rare to see any sort of foreigners around. So. Uh, I wouldn't say there was any sort of racism, but there is a lot of curiosity, right? So, uh, you know, people didn't know anything about people from other countries. So they would ask very direct questions, right? So uh, those can come across as a little bit offensive for people who are not used to it, but, you know, they, they mean no harm. So, yeah, that's uh, sort of the experience, yeah. Okay, so what is, like, some of, was this a part of your childhood goals um the career that you're doing now or what were some of the things you were expecting to get into or is this it 
Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I've been doing a lot of different lines of work. Prior to my PhD program in Japan, I was working in Africa for two years doing NGO work uh, in rural Tanzania. And before that, before that two years, I was in Southeast Asia for three years doing uh, IT startup. So I'm kind of all over the place. But one thing that sort of string together all these different experiences are that um, I am interested in understanding different cultures, different countries, not just from books, but actually living there, interacting with the local people, um, getting to know the, you know, the society and the culture firsthand, right? So uh, that's what really prompted me to, you know, go to different countries, live there, work there, whatever industry it is, uh, just to see what is it like to be in those places, yeah. You mentioned you just finishing up a PhD program. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're what you focused on that? Yeah, this is actually something that's quite relevant. I studied Chinese immigrants in Russia. So yeah, it's a sort of sort of ties into the current events, some of the current events that's happening. But uh, yeah, so this this was, of course, before the war happened and before all these sanctions take pl took place against Russia. Um, I was doing a lot of field work in Russia just to see, you know, uh, what sort of Chinese people go there, what they're doing, you know, what kind of immigrant community they're forming over there. Um, you know, what, what, what's their attitude toward Russia, to their home country, you know, toward the relationship between the two countries, their pro prospects in doing business in Russia, living in Russia, etc. So, yeah, just to understand the Chinese community in Russia as a whole. So what are the reasons that um, a lot of Chinese people are immigrating to Russia? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the history of uh, Chinese-Russian relations, but uh, until 1991, you know, the Rus Russia with the Soviet Union, and there was a lot of conflict between the Soviet Union and China at that time. So the border was pretty much closed until 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. So after 1991, a lot of the border opened back up. And so it allowed a lot of Chinese people to move north into Russia, uh, where they do a lot of small business. So as you guys probably know, China makes a lot of manufactured products, right? Uh, and, um, you know, Chinese businessmen tend to have you know, connections with those factories in China that make these products. So they would be able to buy these products for cheap and sell it in Russia for a higher margin than they can back home in China. So that's what you know, prompted the first wave of migrants uh, showing up uh, in Russia from China, right? And there are other people who are different, doing different things. You know, there are a lot of Chinese companies that are investing in Russia, right? And even right now, right? A lot of in, you know, infrastructure, in natural resources. So there are employees, Chinese employees of these Chinese companies operating in Russia. Uh, that is there as well. And at the same time, you know, China has a lot of people, needs a lot of food. Russia has a lot of land, not that many people. So there are a lot of Chinese farmers that moved north and started doing farming work in Russia, just renting the land in Russia, growing vegetables, growing grains, and ship it back to the Chinese market. So there's a lot of people like that, you know. And at the same time, there are a lot, a lot of students as well, you know, Chinese students studying Russian universities. So it's a pretty diverse group of people. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say it's a currently, is it a good relationship or is it um, rocky at the moment? Or, yeah. Uh, what, what, are, what, is, what are some of the, the surprises that you notice with your studies? Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, with the current events, you know, it's a, it's a very, things are changing very quickly. So it's hard to say, but when I was doing the field work, I would say about a year ago, I, I did field work in Russia quite a few times, but probably the latest was about a year ago, right? Um, the relationship between the two sides at the grassroots level, right? People to people exchange, there's actually not much taking place. Uh, you know, part of it is because there's a language barrier, right? Not a lot of Chinese people speak yeah. Russian. Yeah, and a lot of Russians don't speak Chinese either. So there's a lot of barrier in terms of communication. Of course, they do business. So the simple language of business works, right? But yeah. beyond that, if they want to get into the deeper side of, you know, the cultural debates, you know, what's our, you know, different values, et cetera. They don't have the language skill to hold that sort of communication. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the higher level, you know, government to government level, you know, there's a lot of encouragement, especially on the Russian side, uh, to diversify the country's economic links, right? So Russia used to be very focused on trading with Europe, you know, because that's it's close, right? Yeah. Now, now that you see there's a lot of conflict with Europe, they're trying to diversify their economic links with more focus on the Asia side, you know, that's not just China, but also Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia as well, right? So Russia is trying to find ways to reduce its economic dependence on Russia as well, uh, oh, sorry, on Europe as well. So China is one big factor. So Russian political leaders and business leaders have been, you know, sort of encouraging more Chinese businessmen and Chinese uh, traders to set up shop in Russia and do more business there. Okay. I, I guess to go back to, uh, I guess, the language, I meant to ask yeah. that earlier a little bit for even for listeners and for myself. What is hmm. even you, you said you got to Japan when you were five. Yeah. Um, how long did it, and I meant to ask, what is the language that they speak in Japan? A Japanese, yeah. <laughs> I know it in, in Mandarin in um in China. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So yeah, so uh oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying I didn't want to <laughs> no 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 no, no, no. <laughs> so I, that's why I asked, you know, because yeah. you know, but um what how long did it take you to learn um Mandarin and I, your English is pretty good as well. So did, did that come along with you know as far as in normal education system in Tokyo or? Yeah, so, I mean, I was lucky in that I moved countries when I was fairly young, right? So I moved to Japan when I was five years old. I moved to the US when I was 12, right? And, uh, you know, different, different studies say that, well, I think below, below the age of 16, you can acquire language pretty naturally, right? Just from absorbing it, you know, in your daily life. and not going to like sort of structured learning that adults use. Uh, you can still, you know, absorb languages. So I was lucky enough in that, you know, I was able to be, you know, learning Japanese and learning English within that formative language, formative period, right? So I sort of learned Japanese as well as English fairly naturally, just through going about daily life. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, it, it was quite difficult for my parents. Yeah, they, they were they were a lot older, right? So yeah. And with you traveling, you know, having traveled to a couple of different places, how many languages do you speak now? Uh, you know, in terms of fluency, I mean, I speak English, Japanese, and Chinese. I still speak Chinese at home, right, with my parents, right? So that's their best language. So. I speak Chinese, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I took Korean when I was in university. Um, that was my foreign language requirement back in university. And I lived in Korea for half a year or so, teaching English, so have some first experience with it. Uh, I mentioned I lived in Tanzania. So in Tanzania, they speak a language called Swahili. Right? Uh -huh. uh, and uh, locals in Tanzania, they're not, they're not very familiar with English. And uh, I worked in a very rural area uh, doing sort of NGO work. So I had to learn the local language to survive. So okay. uh, I can, I mean, I, I, I forgot a lot of it, but back when I was living there, I spoke fairly okay Swahili. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so in terms of uh, being able to speak the language, that's, that's really about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. funny that you mentioned 16 because even growing up, um, I immigrated to the US when I was 10, so like I noticed personally how long it takes people under 16 and over 16 and I personally came up with that number just from analyzing you know people around me and, and right, right. Some people that get here uh, pretty late in the game it's like it's hard for them to lose the accent or, or speak a certain yeah. way but yeah that's Wait, so, so, sorry if you don't mind me asking where where did you immigrate from the family um i'm eritrean but i lived in ethiopia for ah, the first 10 years of my life yeah i see yeah yeah you're you're absolutely right you know my my parents um of course they live in the u.s they're working in english-speaking environment but you know clearly you know their their language skill doesn't really go beyond what's required of their work yeah yes. yeah yeah so i mean they can do their work okay with no problem but you know it's uh, of course they can't lose accent that's 
yeah, the accents are always going to be there. But even beyond just like small talk, like small talk with their coworkers, that's not about work, they struggle with. So yeah, that's something that I don't think they'll be able to resolve within their life. But I appreciate it though, because my mom talks to me in Tijinya and mm. like I love it because it just keeps the language fresh in, in, in my in my head. Absolutely. I don't yeah. really get to speak it in my day to day. So yeah. No, I mean I I think you know with my uh PhD study, it's the same thing. You know, people speak Russian in Russia, yeah, they, they speak Chinese to each other. So, I mean, language is sort of a way, especially for a younger generation, to sort of keep both their identities alive, you know? It's sort of, I mean, you know, you, even for these younger Chinese immigrants in Russia, you know, they, they don't know about China, right? They basically grew up in Russia, right? So, I mean, they know China through their parents, whatever their parents say, right? Or maybe they visit once in a while for vacation or something, but they haven't really lived there. So, you know, uh, their, their conception of China is sort of like in their mind, right? Sort of a figment of their imagination. But at the same time, they have something that concretely connects them to the country, you know, through their car, through their parents, through the language, you know, through food, you know, through culture. So, yeah, I think that's very important, yeah, to keep people's multiple identities alive at the same time. Earlier, you mentioned you did some field work. What... What are you doing when you do field work? What does that mean? Yeah. So I, I personally go to Russia and uh, I find the local Chinese communities, right? So those, are, uh, those consist usually of you know, markets where Chinese uh, businessmen set up their businesses doing trading or universities uh, where a lot of Chinese study abroad students are based in. Uh, so then, you know, I find them, you know, I have a set of questions that I want to ask them. And then I ask them to basically introduce all their friends and family members. Right? So that allows me to sort of increase the number of uh, uh, interviewees I can find locally, right? So, and um, yeah, a lot of it, uh, as I mentioned, consists of me asking a set of questions and, you know, based on their answers, the conversation going to tangents, you know, open up a new venue of things to talk about. And beyond that, it's about observation, right? I go to the markets, go to the university. Sometimes I go to their homes, community centers, wherever they hang out. It could be bars, restaurants, right? Just to see, you know, how they interact with each other, how they interact with local Russians, you know, other immigrants, right? So there's a lot of firsthand observations there as well. Okay. And what's usually the process like of the information? Usually once you gather the information, yeah. what, what's usually your, you know, process to, um, I guess, the effect that you want or the change that you're yeah. looking for? I mean, like uh, at, at this point, a lot of it is just about awareness, right? Because this uh, community, the Chinese community in Russia, is not something that uh, a lot of immigration scholars pay attention to, right? I mean, people are interested in big immigration community, uh, immigrant communities, you know? For example, you know, among Chinese people, that'd be, you know, Chinese in the US, Chinese in Europe. Those are very big communities that have been established for generations already. So there are a lot of people studying that. But for Chinese community in Russia, there's basically no one studying it, mm -hmm. right? There are some Russian scholars that are doing it, but because the community is changing all the time, all the information that you get at one point in time, it becomes old very quickly. So yeah, I, for my study, I guess the biggest goal is basically telling people that, you know, first of all, this community exists and, you know, this community is going to be a, uh, you know, as we can see on the news, it's going to be affected by current events quite a bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, the composition of the community, the size of the community, you know, what they do, how they function, all of that is going to change in the next few years. So it's a very interesting case study in, you know, how international relations affect a peer, affect a group of people in their day-to-day -day lives, right? So that sort of um, awareness is one big point. And the second point is sort of studying how, um, what, what we call you know, global South, people who are from developing countries immigrating to other developing countries, right? You know, usually people from developing countries, they move to a rich country, like the US or you know, Britain or something like that. Right. Uh, and that, that process has been studied quite a bit, but now we're seeing a greater trend of poor people moving to poor countries. 
right? I mean, it doesn't mean they're poor, but you know, they're not moving to a country that's already rich on an average level. So, right. so for so for sort of developing country people moving to developing country, um, you know, destinations, it's kind of a different mentality and different process as compared to people moving to the U.S. or Europe. So like, um, you know, for Chinese moving to Russia, that's also one big case study of it, right? Yeah, um, yeah and that has implication that goes beyond China and Russia. So that's something that I wanted to see more of. Okay. So how is the current situation affecting um, the Chinese people in Russia? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is going to be a little bit of my speculation as well, because I haven't been able to go back to Russia recently. Okay. But yeah, but one th- I mean, one thing, you know, you guys might know, you know, R- China has not been one of the countries that actively sanctions Russia, right? As compared to uh, the US and Europe, right? A lot of European countries and the US that. all sanctioned Russia. So there's not going to be any trade uh, between Russia and, you know, US, for instance. Uh, China hasn't been part of that effort. Uh, doesn't mean there isn't any impact, right? Russian economy is not doing so well because of these sanctions. So for traders, that's a big problem because you know they're trying to sell Chinese goods in Russia. But if Russian people don't have money, you're not going to be able to sell the goods, right? So it's going to impact their day-to-day life in that you know their income is going to decline. So it's going to be difficult times for these people as well. But at the same time, you know, their importance to Russia is going to be even bigger because now Russians don't have a choice. You know, they don't have Europeans and Americans alternatives anymore. They, they can't buy Western products anymore. So they have no choice but to buy Chinese products or products from other places where there are no sanctions against Russia. Right. So. That's, uh, that, that makes this uh, Chinese community even more important than before in being able to provide all the goods that Russian people need in their daily lives to survive. Yeah. How, do, how do you see um, cryptocurrency having an um, effect in, I guess, the currency rotation or the, um, yeah, how currency yeah. moves about? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think for, at a high level, I think cryptocurrency is going to be one tool that Russia is going to use to evade sort of the financial sanctions against it, right? Uh, a lot of Russian uh, foreign, uh, foreign reserves was held in US dollars and euro prior to this uh, war in Ukraine. But now that you know they can't use that money anymore, they're gonna, they're actively trying to switch into other forms of reserves, uh, whether that be gold, whether that be cryptocurrency, uh, whether that be, for example, Chinese yuan, you know, other currencies uh, where Russia is not under sanction. So crypt- cryptocurrency is going to feature very, you know, very, you know, uh, very significantly uh, among Russian uh, foreign reserves in the future. So that's at a higher level. But at sort of the grassroots level involving these Chinese businessmen doing business in Russia, a cryptocurrency is not yet that big of a deal. Part of the reason why is that the Chinese immigrants who are doing these sort of business in Russia, they're not very highly educated themselves, right? They're not tech savvy people who know about cryptocurrency or who knows about, you know, how to operate it on a day-to-day basis. So, uh, you know, it's very much still a cash economy. Um, among these traders. So in terms of day-to-day impact of cryptocurrency, I don't see it at the moment. Of course, things can change in the next few years if cryptocurrency becomes more mainstream in that regular people, your average Joes on the street are all using it, then they could become a big part of this normal day-to-day business. But for the moment, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Is there um, anything you want to raise awareness to as far as the Chinese community in Russia that you feel like is not talked about a lot? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I'm, uh, of course, I'm anti-war. I don't advocate the current invasion, but um, 
a lot of uh, sanctions against Russia have hit Russian people quite hard. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you see that a lot of Western businesses are pulling out of Russia and, you know, Russian people's income, they're really, uh, it's really tanking, you know, because uh, the exchange rate between the Russian ruble, the local currency, and different basket of foreign currencies have been really declining. So the, the value of people's incomes, their salaries, have really been declining quite a bit. Uh, like, like something like a third of before the war happened. So, you know, Russian people are really struggling to live just day to day by all the, you know, things that they need just to survive. So that's something that, um, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's a collateral damage from the war, but it's not something that mainstream media has uh, been covering. Um, so what I do, I, I do wonder these days is that whether this sort of situation actually brings more Russian people to be against the war, or they will struggle to think about the war now that they have more important things to worry about, you know, they worry about whether they can have the next meal, you know, that's going to be something that they're going to be worrying about much more than, you know, what, 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 what can I do to help end the war in Ukraine, right? So it, it, it kind of uh, makes the effort of winning the hearts and minds of the Russian people and get them onto the anti-war side, much more difficult. You know, people are just struggling every day to survive. So yeah, that's something that um, I, I hope a lot more news media outlets will be able to cover and talk about. Yeah, because I don't think people understand like what a sanction is. I've actually got to spend a couple of months in a country that was sanctioned and mm. it really I got to witness the effect it has on the economy and what you can do and can't do and right it, it's, it's pretty crazy effect that it has on the day-to-day -day lives of the people there especially if they're doing business international and yeah. they use U.S. dollars and things like that so yeah. I think people just think oh it's been sanctioned and they kind of simplify the whole thing and they don't understand like the the regular people who have probably no choice in what the government is doing they're yeah. being affected by all of this stuff and it, it's yeah yeah yeah, yeah and the reality is russia was quite connected to the international economy before the Ukraine war started, right? A lot of Western businesses operate in Russia and they hire a lot of Russians to work for them, right? So, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of people just suddenly losing their jobs, right? Uh, yeah, and it's not just about consumers not having choices of what to buy, it's just about people, you know, not having jobs, you know? Um, and that is, really impacting the country quite a bit yeah so this sudden before and after this big change that happened before sanction after sanction that that is some that's not something that you know people can really get used to in a couple of weeks time yeah. yeah yeah if you could possibly i can't say possibly i could say what almost what what you, how you would like this to kind of play out or how you see things kind of playing out. How do you predict, you know, some of how the way things are moving, it yeah. getting better? How do you see the 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 sun, you know, sunshine at the end of the tunnel? I mean, after all of I mean, I, I unfortunately I'm a rather bleak person, so I don't know if I can portray it as a sunshine. But <laughs> one one thing one thing I I think uh, what's gonna happen is that you see the war on the ground in Ukraine is coming to a stalemate where you know no one is really you know winning, no one's really losing. Uh, at some point, we might have a ceasefire in Ukraine where it's just like, okay, everybody just hold, hold fire. We're just going to stop this right here, right? So, the, so, the, so that, that means there is no, there's going to be no more shooting, which is great for the civilians uh, who are caught in the crossfire. But when the guns fell silent, it doesn't mean the sanctions against Russia will be gone. I think... You know, whatever sanctions that are already levied against Russia at this moment, it's going to be there for a long time, even after the war in Ukraine somehow comes to an end. So uh, I think a lot of news media uh, outlets also talk about this, but 
it's sort of a new frontier for the global economy where you have a big country like Russia, you know, facing sanctions, you know, from the international community, basically for years at the end, right? I mean, it's not the first time sanction was levied against the country, but it has never been levied so comprehensively against the economy as big as Russia, right? And as important to international trade as Russia. So this is going to change how people think about how the global economy works, right? Um, you know, if, if Russia is fair game, then who's next, right? Like we set a precedent in that, you know, we can, we can you know, sort of exclude an economy this big from the international uh, economy this quickly, right? So if we can do it against Russia, we can do it again, again, against somebody else. So it's sort of, you know, from my line of work, it sort of is a business risk, right? The yeah. sanction risk, yeah? It's not about how your business is doing. It's about where your business uh, is located in and how that country is doing in terms of international relations and how, how much risk it is at, of, you know, uh, having a bad sort of conflict with other countries and being sanctioned. So that's a very scary prospect. Yeah, it's quite complicated. And I really appreciate you for educating me uh, on, on uh, lack uh, of uh, I'm, you know, very beginner in the politics, not really, I can't say beginner, it's just something that I don't put too much in, too energy into. So this definitely, you know, fills in a lot, I'm able to ask you, you know, some pretty um, impressive questions to where I'm educating myself on it, and you're able to just provide a great analogy of what's going on, on a, you know, very educational level, I appreciate it. No, I, I think, uh, you know, um, living in uh, Japan, for instance, people have a different perspective to the war as, you know, back home in the U.S., right? You know, they're located in a different part of the world, you know, uh, Japan is right next to Russia. So uh, a lot of things are, doesn't feel very far away, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask uh, if, it, if this thing, uh, you know, with Russia and Ukraine affects business risk in Tokyo, you know, in Japan in general. So yeah, so, so Japan is, is one of the countries that decided to sanction Russia, uh, right? So right now there, there should be no business between Russia and Japan. But in reality, you know, Japan is a country that lacks natural resources. So all of its oil, gas, you know, a lot of uh, commodities, you know, metals, all of that is imported from abroad. And Russia has been and continue is, is still um, a very big exporter of natural resources, right? Oil, gas, uh, nickel, uh, platinum, uh, all of that. Um, and a lot of that gets imported into Japan as well. So while Japan is sanctioning Russia, it's also really struggling to look for alternatives, right? If we don't buy gas from Russia, then where are we going to get it, right? So, uh, and uh, of course, there are other countries that, you know, um, make gas, you know, produce gas and export gas, but you know, it takes time to reroute your supply chains, you know? You're going to have to build those business relationships from scratch and, you know, create those logistics networks that doesn't happen in a day or two you know it takes right. months and yeah. sometimes years to make that happen so for japan to actively shift away from russia in terms of its natural resource needs it's going to take years to happen but you know it's it's already making a move uh, on that front wow. i was wow. going to say it takes you know <sighs> Uh, well, I know even no, with you saying, um, you said you're not that far from, from Russia. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we're, we're on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can basically look and see America from Russia, you yeah, yeah. from America as well. So. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Japan also has um, some um, historical issues with Russia in that the countries have territorial disputes. Uh, there are four islands in northern Japan that both Russia and Japan claims as, as its own you know, sovereign territory. So right now, the four islands are being administered by Russia. So Russian troops 
are on those four islands, right? But Japan has never given up, you know, uh, trying to get those four islands back. Right. So mm. before this Ukraine war happened, the, the two countries have been constant negotiation about, you know, what to do with those four, four islands. Right. And Japan was at the time, you know, thinking about, OK, if you allow us the sovereignty of this or joint sovereignty of these four islands, we'll be able to invest more, you know, to create like, you know, more, you know, bigger economy on those four islands. Right. So that was sort of the carrot that was the Japanese government was offering to the Russian government in order to, for them to access these four islands. But now with the sanctions taking place, of course, that's not going to be possible anymore. Right. There's mm -hmm. not going to be any economic cooperation between the two. So there is a sort of a new rhetoric uh, among Japanese government officials saying that, OK, you know what, these four islands, Russians are illegally occupied. They're our islands, right? So, uh, because you know, before they didn't say this so straightforwardly, right? Now they're just going out and saying that you know it's our territory, Russia is illegally occupied, right? So now you know, not just with the economic issues, now you have this political issue involving these four islands. It's going to be very tense times between the Japanese and Russian governments moving forward. Wow. Do people yeah. expect the sanctions? I mean, there's no way to know, obviously, but do they expect it to last a, a really long time or, you know, because, you know, you mentioned earlier with even the gas for Japan uh, or any other material, um, you know, you're going to have to find a new direction, which it could take years. Yeah. And do you really trust that the sanction would last a long time or is it? You know, I just wonder. Sometimes. Yeah. So with the with the uh, with the fact that you can't use Russian natural resources, uh, mm -hmm. prices for a lot of things are going to go up, right? right. Um, yeah. So we haven't really felt it here yet, but I think soon enough, people are gonna really start feeling it in their wallets. You know, uh, you know, just the things that they buy from day to day, all of them is gonna go up. And um, of course, you know, politicians can explain it in other ways. You know, they can sort of say, okay, this is not actually due to Russia sanctions. It's maybe some other factor. They can somehow explain it, but at some point, you know, the prices are going to go up so much that people can't help but wonder, you know, what's going to happen? You know, what if we didn't have the sanction? place you know is it going to make our lives easier is it going to make everything cheaper you know people are going to think about it that way um i think you know um japan japan does import a lot of things from uh, russia so it, it's going to have this sort of impact as well maybe in europe things are going to be way worse because they are much more dependent on trade with europe uh, with uh, russia than japan is so I think if European voters in particular start asking questions about why prices for everything are so high nowadays, I think it's going to make sustaining the sanctions very, very difficult. Yeah. I can, I still can see, you know, things, but it's going to be a quite the evolution to a lot of things from yeah. electric to well, you know, just yeah, just like a lot yeah. of creative yeah. ways to substitute the trades. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. They're going to be, you know, move toward renewable energy, you know, uh, to replace Russian gas and oil, right? So that's going to happen. But like, same with the supply chain, it's not going to happen in a day or two. You know, it's going to take years of investment to, you know, uh, to make it happen. So, uh, maybe in the long term, you know, um, things, there wouldn't be much of an economic impact, but in the short term, it's going to be pretty painful for everyone. Okay. Yeah. So I guess to go back to some of your, um, your travel things, what's one of your favorite places you've had the opportunity to work out of all of the places you've, you've um, experienced? So, I mean, as I mentioned, I worked in Tanzania for a couple of years uh, before I came back to Japan to do my PhD. And um, 
you know, what, what I was actually doing there was, as I mentioned, I worked in NGO, but uh, I was uh, working agricultural microfinance. So what that means is I provide small loans to farmers so that they can buy sort of good seeds, good fertilizers, and improve the quantity and quality of their agricultural produce, right? So because it was very agriculture related, I didn't live in a big city. I basically lived in the countryside where the farmers are. So I can, you know, work directly with them, check how they're doing, you know, check whether they're using the products correctly, all of that. And um, I, I grew up in urban areas, right? Compared to that, I, I grew up in very urban areas. So for me, you know, living in the African countryside was a brand new experience that I never had. Right. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the lifestyle is different. But what's more impressive that I felt was sort of the value toward the living life that people had. It's just mm -hmm. like, you know, of course, people didn't have much in terms of uh, material comfort. You know, um, I, you know, by conventional means, you know, we have to say you know, they're not very uh, well off. Uh, but, you know, people tend to be very relaxed about their being, you know, it's like we have, okay, we have enough to eat, we have, uh, you know, enough to, you know, um, in, enough clothes on our backs, you know, we have a roof over our, uh, roof, a roof over the top of our heads, and, you know, for, for, the, for a lot of locals, that was good enough, you know, that was good enough, as long as they don't go hungry, and, you know, as long as they're not, um, they have a place to live, a lot of people are very relaxed about their situation, they're not always asking, you know, uh, how can we be better? You know, how can we be richer? <laughs> so that, that wasn't something that people were interested in. So that sort of relaxed lifestyle is not something that, you know, um, we living in this modern capitalist economy sort of understand, you know, or, you know, um, it, it's, uh, it's sort of a brand new perspective that I was able to gain by living in the Tanzanian countryside. Yeah, that was one of the countries on our list yeah and i'm, to glad, check out. I'm glad you sh shared the tip of knowing the language for before right. we get there i know <laughs> is that just in rural ruler areas mm -hmm. or like in the cities and stuff is you know is is it easier to get by with english or you know so so this is the case for tanzania and also for a lot of neighboring countries but uh, obviously, you have people who, who went to university and who have international connections that tend to be quite proficient in English. And for Tanzania, because it was at one point, I believe, a British colony. So a lot of the universities use English as a medium of instruction. Oh. Uh, and this is still true because a lot of the textbooks are not written in the local language. So they have to import them. And of course, those imported books tend to be English. So people have to know English at the university level in order to, you know, study properly. Right. But um, university students are a very small group of people in the overall population, right? So even in the big cities, uh, once you get away from, you know, the university areas and areas where a lot of university graduates live, uh, it's relatively more difficult to get, get by with just English. And um, for a country like Tanzania, what's interesting is that there are different tribes that make up the country's population, right? In Tanzania, there are over a hundred tribes, they say, uh, and uh, each tribe have their own language. And sometimes you go from one village to another, they speak a completely different language. Uh, so you wouldn't know what the tribal language is. Yeah. So, so people use uh, Swahili as sort of a common language to communicate among the tribes, but that doesn't mean, you know, you're not going to, you're going to, you know, Swahili, you understand everything that people say. When, when locals in the village, they talk to each other, they still use the tribal language. So if you, even if you speak Swahili fluently, you're not going to know what they're saying, right? So yeah, there's a lot of limitations uh, in terms of, uh, yeah communication. You really have to know a lot of languages to be able to uh, get to talk to locals uh, freely uh, in rural Africa. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's similar in Ethiopia and in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. Like everybody grows up knowing like five different languages. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I, I think is I think that's great though because you know once you speak multiple languages you're able to be more flexible in your mind because you know people think different think uh, different languages so yeah. it makes you more flexible make you more open yeah, that's a good thing yeah. Definitely a good thing yeah well before we get ready to close things out um is there any um new projects or anything that you're working on you'd like to share with the audience or where they can find certain information to learn more about you know being educated on what you have going on yeah uh, so in the beginning during the self-introduction um you know uh i was uh, i was introduced as the founder and managing director of the, this uh, organization called the study abroad research institute so this is a small ngo that i run uh from tokyo uh, where the main goal is to help african students to study abroad in japan so basically linking African high school students and university students with Japanese universities that are taking foreign students, right? So it's sort of a, a sort of a platform for providing information on Japanese universities to African students. Of course, with the COVID pandemic, right now it's very difficult to do anything. But once uh, the pandemic blows over, hopefully, uh, and when the borders open back up, we'll be able to get more African students to come to Japan to study, you know? Uh, and, and to do that, I have been talking to different African high schools, educational institutions and uh, universities, NGOs, talking to local students, uh, just uh, providing them with awareness that, you know, studying abroad in Japan is, is a realistic option for them in the future. Right, so that's uh, something that I have been working on, you know, and um, yeah, I do hope more people will be interested uh, in helping out, you know, people studying abroad, not just between Africa and Japan, but just between anywhere, any two countries, you know, study abroad is always a very good first step for people to get to know other countries when they have no experience with anywhere else. So yeah, that's something that, uh, yeah, I hope people will be more involved anywhere, yeah. Are there certain uh, countries you're targeting, or yeah? So, so for this uh, for this uh, particular organization, I'm mostly targeting countries in Anglophone West Africa at the moment. So we're talking about Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, the Gambia. Um, so these countries, obviously, people already speak English, which is great, uh, and. The Japanese uh, universities have, uh, in recent years, gradually expanded the number of English-only programs that are available for foreign students. So these uh, Anglophone West African students have a natural advantage in getting into these English-only programs in Japanese universities. So that's the first target. You know, eventually, you know, maybe it will expand it into other areas of the world. But for now, that's the focus. You know? Okay. Yeah, I definitely agree with the um, exchange programs. Um, I had an um, exchange student from Brazil when I was yeah. Uh, like, yeah, middle school. Yeah. We actually had two. And I had a chance to go to Brazil when I was around 15. And it definitely wow, helped as, you know, educate me on, you know, what's going on in Brazil, or even just the lifestyle and yeah. the exchange student. And of course, it definitely opened him up yeah. to what it's like to live in Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I'm sure, you know, you can you can probably read books about Brazil, but going there is a totally different experience. You oh, know, you're going to you're going to you're going to learn things that nobody's going to write about write about in books. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I've definitely enjoyed this conversation and I've learned a lot. I really appreciate your time and consideration and your positive energy and that you've brought with the conversation and everything. I really appreciate it. No, thank you guys very much for allowing me to be on the podcast. Yes. And we'd love to have you back in the future. We always invite people back or we can say like, if you're ever in Los Angeles, feel free to hit us up and stop yeah. by for an in-studio conversation. Yeah. You know? That sounds great. Yeah. We'd love to uh, be back, you know, when you guys have a new topic that you want to uh, talk about in a future podcast episode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. And for the listeners, thank you for listening thank you. and supporting. Uh, you can find the podcast at AmericanGypsy.com. 
And you can find consistent self-improvement merch at luamli.com. And, and we'll have links below as well, or yeah. links to um, all of these sites as well. Um, thank you again for everyone. You can also find music under Classic Carpenter, K-L-A-C-C-I-K-C-A-R-P-E-N-T-A. On Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Tidal, all major platforms. Thank you again to everyone for listening and supporting. Consistent self-improvement to everyone. And peace. peace.